Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to, for joining us for this webinar dedicated to thermoelectrics. Uh, this is the outline of uh, this webinar. We will start uh, with a short introduction to present you uh, the project enables. Uh, then uh, I will present you briefly some principles and theory about thermoelectrics and we will uh, discuss more in detail about the materials and devices development, uh, the power management and some use case. And uh, we will conclude with a session of question and answer. So first, let me introduce you briefly the three speakers uh, for this webinar. So I'm the first one. Uh, I'm Guillaume Savelli, I'm project manager and expert in thermoelectrics at CL10 in France. Uh, our research are mainly based on nanostructured materials, thermal sensors, and energy harvesting. Uh, we will have uh, Peter Spice, uh, who is group manager of the group Integrated Energy Supplies at Fraunhofer Institute for integrated circuits uh, in department self-powered radio system, and he is also business field coordinator of IoT systems. And the last one is uh, Rafil Razib, who is a senior staff researcher leading the Advanced Energy Materials Group at Tyndall UCC uh, in the development of thermoelectric materials and micro devices for energy harvesting and thermal management. So, Let's start with the, a brief presentation of uh, the project uh, enables. So what problem are we solving uh, with this project? The first one uh, is the industry challenge. Uh, we know that the world will have 1 trillion IoT devices by 2025, all needing power. So it corresponds around uh, 100 IoT device uh, for every person. It's huge. So uh, we have to eliminate the need for battery replacements where possible. So it corresponds to, to develop energy harvesting solutions and find ways to reduce the power of consumption of devices. The second challenge is uh, about research excellence. Uh, we plan to uh, collaboratively and concurrently develop applications oriented and optimized solutions. So the goal is to get academic and industry developers of energy harvesting components and systems, as well as IoT devices to work together, to accelerate and optimize the development of parts and systems. And uh, also uh, parts uh, should be standardized and interoperable. So what are we doing? Uh, we want to build an ecosystem for collaboration, uh, by starting with uh, the project Enables. So Enables is a 5.2 million uh, euro European uh, project. Uh, we create self-sustaining energy solutions to power the Internet of Things based on energy harvesting, uh, energy storage, power management, and system integration activities. The goal is to provide external fast track technology access uh, to expertise and laboratories, uh, to foster internal joint research activities between partners guided by needs and opportunities, to create standardized and interoperable libraries of parts and simulation tools for optimizing system level performance. And finally, uh, to use enables to foster a starting community. So we have two main parts in uh, Enables, the transnational access and the joint research activities. The transnational access funding is there to facilitate the free of charge uh, access by the external user community to expertise and infrastructures of the Enables uh, partners. A typical uh, transnational access is uh, in order of uh, 10 or 20 uh, days of work and can be, uh, for example, an initial feasibility study, uh, device characterizations, or uh, materials property measurements, for example. The transnational access is complemented by the joint research activity 
to facilitate the internal collaboration uh, between the enables partners. And uh, in GRA, we work on the main topic for IoT. So it corresponds to energy harvesting, energy storage, micro power management, and uh, system integration. So the transnational access program is very interesting because it's a free of charge access to equipment, tools, and expertise to do powering IoT feasibility studies uh, in the center across Europe. So we work on paper, simulations, prototype, characterization, system optimizations. We propose uh, also a virtual access uh, to database of a real life vibrational energy source. So uh, transnational access is open to industry and academia. So researchers, developers, integrators of IoT materials, devices, and systems. So it's open to everyone. Uh, if you want to, to access to our facilities, it's something very easy. Uh, you just have to sign up and inquire at the project uh, website. Uh, you have the address of the uh, project here, or you can also contact by email uh, Paul Rosengrave. Uh, you have this uh, email here. It's very easy. And then you can then have access to our facilities uh, in all the fields that uh, I'm just going to present you. So energy harvesting, energy storage, uh, power management, etc. Okay, so uh, now I think it's time to uh, to present you uh, the webinar uh, with the thermoelectric part. So I'm just going to present you uh, very briefly some principle and theory. And uh, we start with uh, history. So the, the first uh, thermoelectric effect has been discovered uh, 200 years ago by Seebeck. Uh, uh, when he discovered that uh, a potential difference is created when a temperature difference is applied at the extremities of a material. So you have two materials here at two different temperatures, and then a, vo a different, uh, potential difference is created, and this uh, potential is directly proportional to the temperature difference via uh, a coefficient called Seebeck coefficient, and this coefficient by convention is negative for n type materials and positive for p type materials. Few years later, uh, Pelletier uh, discovered the opposite effect, uh, but he, he gave a wrong definition of uh, the Pelletier effect. He thought that when a current was applied through a solid, uh, there was a moving of it from one side to the other side. But the right definition of the Pelletier effect was defined uh, four years uh, later by Lenz. And the accurate definition is when a current goes through a material in contact with another material, that's the difference, there is a production and visa an absorption of it at its extremities. For a thermoelectric converter, you have two main working modes. The first one uh, is based on the Seebeck effect. This is the thermoelectric generator mode. In this case, you applied a temperature difference uh, across your device. So for example, you can hit one side of your device and then you're going to generate uh, a current and uh, a power. On the contrary, you have the thermoelectric cooling mode, which use the Peltier effect. In this case, you supply your device and you're going to create a temperature difference between the two sides of your device. There are three main uh, properties for thermoelectric materials. The Seebeck coefficients, the electrical conductivity, and the thermal conductivity. These three parameters are linked together and define the dimensionless power factor called ZT. So you have here the definition of ZT, where you find 
the three main parameters uh, for the materials. And when you look at the maximum of conversion efficiency for uh, a thermoelectric uh, devices, this is the product of two terms. The first one is directly uh, the Carnot efficiency. And the second one is uh, linked to the thermoelectric system efficiency where you can find Zt. If you look at the temperature dependence of the conversion efficiency and the uh, depending of Zt, you can see on this figure uh, that higher Zt, higher conversion efficiency. So the objective is to have to obtain the highest Zt uh, for the materials. So that's now what we are going to, to present you, the, the materials and devices developments. So here at CEA, uh, we work on thin films, uh, thermoelectric materials uh, grown by uh, chemical vapor deposition. We develop nanostructured materials to increase their thermoelectric properties and uh, staying compatible with microelectronic environment. So you can see here uh, our progress on thin film nanostructured materials. Our first generation of materials was silicon, silicon germanium superlattices. You can have here the same picture of a monocrystalline uh, superlattices. Then we have developed a second generation. Uh, it was Contundent superlattices, uh, and more specifically, the integration of germanium uh, nanoparticle inside a silicon germanium matrix. You can see here the uh, same picture of such QDSL, and you have in white uh, the germanium uh, nanoparticles. And finally, we have developed uh, a third generation of nanostructured materials. So uh, it corresponds to silicides quantum dot superlattices. We have developed two kinds of such QDSL with uh, titanium silicides nanoparticule and molybdenum silicides nanoparticule, uh, always embedded inside the silicon germanium matrix. So it corresponds to the small uh, white points that you can see here. So as you can see, all these materials uh, correspond to silicon and silicon germanium based materials. So they are fully compatible uh, with a microelectronic and CMOS environment. If we look uh, for the characteristics, the thermoelectric properties of such uh, materials. So here, this is the example for the titanium silicides based QDSL. So you have two examples. The first one is a monocrystalline structure and the second one a polycrystalline structure. We have measured the thermoelectric properties of such QDSL and we have compared them to uh, a silicon germanium uh, layer without nanostructuration, but with the same germanium content and with the same doping. So just to compare the influence of the nanostructuration. And as you can see, we obtain simultaneously uh, a higher power factor and a lower thermal conductivity for the both cases. So this is a very good result. And it shows the increase of the thermoelectric properties thanks to the nanostructuration. I'm also going to present you two kinds of uh, device that we developed uh, here at CEA. The first one uh, corresponds to thermoelectric sensors for thermal management. So the goal is to perform thermal management in microelectronic environments, uh, environment uh, which is a CMOS compatible. So you can see here an int browser on the daughter board with an hot chip, and we have integrated uh, several micro tests around uh, these hot chips. So uh, the, goal, the goal is to measure the thermal flow and prevent uh, these hot chips from damage. So you can see here a, a top view, uh, a microscopic top view of uh, the micro test. So it's like a serpentine and we alternate uh, N and P type uh, materials. 
So these uh, serpentine uh, have been made uh, in silicon germanium as a reference and also integrating or QGSL materials that I, I, I just uh, presented you before. And you can see here uh, the sensitivity of the sensor. So it corresponds to the voltage generated uh, by the sensor when applying a, a power uh, in the hot source. And uh, as you can see, uh, we have obtained uh, higher sensitivity for all uh, micro uh, integrating QDSL compared to uh, silicon germanium materials. So here again, it shows that uh, the influence of the nanostructuration is maintained uh, at the device level. Another example for the energy harvesting uh, so here again, we have developed a micro thermoelectric generator uh, compatible in CMOS technology, so always for microelectronic environment. So we have developed a specific uh, 2.5D microtag architecture uh, that we have combined with microchannel technologies. So what it is called 2.5D architecture it's because you can see here, we have an, elect an uh, in-plane electrical flow combined with a cross-plane thermal flow. Usually uh, the electrical and the thermal flow are uh, always in the same plane. So uh, in-plane or cross-plane, but this time we have separate them and we have uh, uh, an in-plane electrical uh, flow and a cross-plane thermal flow. Here you can see uh, on this picture, you can see this different segment. So it corresponds to the P-type and N-type materials. You have here this uh, big uh, metallic uh, block. Uh, they have been integrated here uh, to um, focus the heat on, the, on this junction. And here you have the micro channel technology to dissipate the heat coming from these junctions and to have the delta T between these two sides. So using uh, the specific uh, technology, we have obtained an electrical power at a 680 microwatts. Uh, measured for a corresponding uh, temperature difference equal to uh, uh, 15 degrees. Uh, so this is a very high value uh, for such micro -tech, uh, technology and uh, highly enough to use it in IoT environment, for example. Okay, now uh, it's time for me uh, to let the, also the uh, following speaker to present this part, Razib. Razib, can you hear me? Can, maybe you can share your screen now. Hello, can you hear me? We can yeah. hear you and we can see you, yeah? Okay, okay, okay. So let me share my screen. Okay, so can everyone see? We can, yeah, yeah, that's good, censorship. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Guillaume. Uh, very nice introduction on the presentation. So in Tyndall, we are also developing uh, thin film thermoelectric materials, but our process or the fabrication process is a little bit different. Here we developing these thermoelectric materials uh, on silicon platform using electroplating or electrodeposition technique, you know, 
because uh, it is it is easy to synthesize new kind of materials. It has got low processing temperature, and of course, it is silicon compatible technique. You know, uh, after developing these materials, we use a different kind of technique, as you can see, uh, or characterization technique for to characterize these materials and. Uh, all these techniques are available uh, through enables. Uh, I'm not going into the details of each, each of these technique, but I will uh, draw your attention to this particular technique where we can, we can, we can test the uh, micro devices. Uh, this particular system we developed in Tyndall uh, where we can uh, maintain a temperature gradient across the device, as well as we can apply different kind of pressure on the device. And uh, we can characterize this device uh, both as a power generator as well as thermoelectric cooler. So uh, we started depositing different kind of materials, uh, P-type materials. Here is an example where uh, we developed bismuth antimony telluride electroplated films on silicon. Uh, traditionally, uh, these materials need annealing uh, at pretty uh, high temperature, about 300 degrees centigrade. Uh, but the problem is that these tel tellurium usually escape because of its high vapor pressure. So the traditional method is that to anneal these materials in um, um, tellurium atmosphere for 60 hours, you know, uh, which is not acceptable by the industry. So we developed an innovative technique where we put a thin layer of tellurium sandwiched between uh, bismuth antimony telluride, and then we do annealing in nitrogen, nitrogen atmosphere only for one hour. So uh, this middle layer of tellurium is, is acting as a kind of a reservoir and, and uh, replenish the tellurium that is being uh, escaping from both sides of the film. So we uh, see that uh, these materials has effect in terms of annealing temperature as well as annealing time. And the best, best uh, power factor we achieved uh, to when we anneal them at 350 degree uh, for one hour. Uh, so uh, in terms of N-type materials, we developed some very interesting materials. One of them is uh, copper bismuth telluride. And uh, we found that uh, when we start putting more and more copper in the solution, as an ionic concentration is increasing, uh, just over one millimolar, we found that there is a complete uh, collapse of the crystal structure, as you can see from this XRD graph here, and which is about just over 10% of copper in the film. The crystal structure almost almost collapsed here, you know. And a close view under the TEM, we saw that the films is almost amorphous, you know, but there are some nanocrystallites of bismuth telluride. Uh, that are almost homogeneously distributed across the film. You know, uh, these particular films gives us pretty good power factor, just just over three milliwatt. You know, uh, so we got very interested that you know about these doping using copper, and uh, we developed another material which is also N-type material where we uh, again uh, starting with pure tellurium and we start putting more and more copper and as you can see that just over 10% uh, of copper concentration the crystal structure completely collapsed uh, but this time we found that the power factor is much better almost double compared to the copper bismuth telluride which is um, 5.6 milliwatt you know so we were very uh, happy about these materials uh, here is the summary of the materials that we developed uh, very recently, we also start investigating the, their thermal conductivity, and some of the, the initial results is very promising, which is showing very high uh, figure of merit, as you can see here. Uh, but of course, we need to, uh, you know, uh, double check all these values that these are correct, you know. Uh, after developing these materials, we thought that's okay, why not putting these materials and develop some device? And before we develop this device on silicon platform, we thought that's okay, let's let's look at the effect of the size or shape of these PNN legs, you know? So we developed uh, a model, a console model, where we start with a PNN legs, as you can see here on the left top side, uh, and we vary the shape of the pillars, you know, 
uh, height of the pillars, thickness of the interconnect material, filler material, and also ratio of the area of P and N legs. Um, so we found that uh, when the sh uh, shape of the pillars we vary from the square to the you know um, circular to the hexagonal shape, uh, if the cross-sectional area is same, then there is no effect in the overall power output. By the way, we are keeping uh, a temperature gradient of five degree across these pillars. You know. Um, 300 degree, uh, 300 degree Kelvin and 305 degree Kelvin. And we are looking at the voltage output and the power output, you know. And uh, as when the, when we vary the load resistance and it matches with the internal resistance, we found that we get a peak in the output power. Uh, and we found that um, if we keep the overall um, area constant and the number of pillar constant, then we have to vary the cross-sectional area of the pillars. And then there is a direct effect in terms of power output. And of course, because square pillar has the larger cross-sectional area, it, it gives you the uh, better power output. You know. uh, in terms of the height of the pillars, when we increase the height of the pillars, uh, the electrical resistance increases linearly, you know, as you can see here the height of the pillars, different height of the pillars. Uh, but the thermal conductance, we found that the thermal conductance, which is the blue line here, it, it, it's get reduced, the overall thermal conductance for the larger height of the pillar. Uh, and the overall uh, voltage output, you can see that also increased uh, up to 10 microwatt, and then it, uh, there is almost no change. So when we look at the overall power output, as a function of height of the pillar, we found that uh, just over around three micro micrometer, you know, thickness, uh, we we get the get, get the peak output power. But the problem is that to maintain a temperature gradient, you know, uh, without any um, uh, active thermal management is very difficult at that such a small height of the pillar. So we we felt that about ten microwatt is 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 a good choice, you know. And uh, we also look at the thickness of the interconnect material, which the materials that is connecting the P and N legs, as you can see here, you know, and we vary the thickness of these pillars. And we found that if we increase the thickness, the uh, electrical resistance, of course, it, 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 it get reduced, you know, but beyond five micro, micro, micrometer thickness, you know, it does not vary too much. And the overall power output also, also does not, uh, have any effect, you know, uh, beyond five microwatts, you know. So we felt that uh, gold is pretty th uh, pretty expensive, and you know, five micron gold is is very expensive. So we we felt that three to four micron is a, is a good compromise, you know, if we, if we take that. Uh, of course, we also look at the overall filler of the material as a mechanical stability of these P and N legs, you know, and we found that the vacuum has the has the best because there is no thermal shunt. Uh, in the Z axis. Uh, here is also pretty good, you know, it, it does not affect too much, but any other material, any other polymer material, if we put it uh, in, in these as a filler material, it act, act as a thermal shunt, you know, in the Z axis, and it reduce the overall power output. So we felt that if we can maintain here, uh, uh, that means nothing, we do not put anything, it, it would be very good. And as you as you saw that the p-type materials power factor or the efficiency is not very good, you know, in our case in our material. So we thought that if we increase the overall cross section of the p-type material, the overall power factor will match like the n-type material. So we we vary the ratio of the AP by AN ratio. AP is the uh, a cross sectional area of p-type material, and AN is the cross sectional area of the n-type material. And we look at uh, their uh, thermal conductance and electrical resistance, and we found that of course we, if we increase the ratio, the thermal conductance increases, you know, and the electrical resistance decreases. But if we look at the overall power output, we found that just around 1.5 uh, AP by N ratio, we get a peak output power, you know. But uh, uh, sorry, um, the efficiency is the peak, you know, not the output power, the efficiency is at the, at the peak at AP by N ratio of 1.5. But the uh, overall power output is, is, not, is not very good, you know, just around, you know, three microwatt for a single leg pairs. So we felt that you know maybe uh, two aspect ratio two is a good compromise you know where the efficiency is pretty good as well as the you know the power output is 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 not not bad as well you know so based on that uh, all these uh, uh, data we start developing our uh, device you know so we we did the mass design 
And uh, we, we put two separate scheme. One is a flip chip bonded device and other is a single wafer. And I will, I will describe what, what, what that mean uh, in the next slide. Um, so what, what the flip chip bonded means is that uh, the P type legs will be developed or fabricated in one wafer and N type is on another wafer. And then after dicing, we will do the flip chip bonding. And you can see here the cross-sectional area of a single leg, which is bonded using indium. And this is kind of a the uh, X-ray uh, image that all the legs are properly connected. And here is a photograph of the final device you can see. Uh, of course, we look at their uh, single legs. Uh, you know, the electrical resistance, the calculated resistance is around 0.4, but we, we measured 0.8, which is almost double, you know. And of course, when we put them as a temperature gradient of 10 degree, we, we get a voltage output of 90 millivolt, you know. Uh, which is again uh, much less than the calculated value. So we felt that you know the the interface resistance plays a big big role you know here in the overall efficiency of the device. Um, so what we did is that we also develop a device on a single wafer. That means both P and N legs are developed on the same wafer. You know, and here is a photograph of one of those devices. You can see, and we also measured them, and seventy percent of the device is active. And at a temperature gradient of 10 degree, we get a voltage output just over 42 millivolts. And uh, here is a photograph of uh, a scene photograph of the second generation of the device. You know, uh, so we, we felt that of course there is a problem or an issue with the interface, the semiconductor metal interface. So we investigated that further, and we we, we felt that uh, we need to come with a better solution. So we developed different kind of material system on, on bismuth telluride based material, as you can see here in the schematic and also on the cross-sectional ACM image here. And we, we, found, we work with different material, titanium gold, titanium nickel, and tungsten gold. And we, we found that uh, tungsten gold or go, uh, is, is the best material, which gives us the lowest contact resistance, about 2.6 milli ohms, you know, which is about just over 1.3% uh, of the total device resistance. You know. Uh, not only that, we characterize these devices as a uh, thermoelectric cooler, as a single leg, and we found that the device can dissipate a record high heat flux, which is uh, over 720 uh, watt per centimeter square, as you can see here in the CCD camera, and, and the data here you can see. At a, at a particular applied current. And we can also achieve a net cooling over four uh, degree Kelvin with a, with a record uh, small response time of only 20 microseconds, which is also a record. Uh, this work is done in collaboration with Trinity College and Nokia Bell Labs uh, Ireland. So uh, in summary, uh, we in Tyndall, we developed some very interesting materials. Of course, we are keep on working to develop better P-type materials. And uh, also we developed some uh, very interesting uh, micro thermoelectric device uh, on silicon platform. And the work is going on to characterize the second generation uh, of these uh, devices. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. I think uh, the next speaker is Peter, and Peter will describe or uh, tell you about the very important power management of these devices and some use case. So thank you. Thank you, Rasib and Guillaume, for that exciting insight on materials of thermoelectric devices. So can you see my screen? We can, yeah, thanks, Peter. Okay, so I will now talk uh, furthermore on the power management, which is required to use the voltages from thermoelectric harvester and to supply uh, new different applications with it. So since uh, thermoelectric generators as well as solar cells provide only small voltages, as you have already seen uh, from my two colleagues uh, in the preceding slides, to really use the output voltages of thermoelectric harvesters, boost regulators are used. So these are voltage converters, which use a small voltage and upconvert that small voltages to higher voltages, for example, two volts or three volts or four volts, so that you can supply state-of-the-art electronic like sensors wireless transceivers or microcontrollers. 
The architecture you can see here on the right side uh, is using a junction fed transistor. This is a transistor which is normally on. And uh, um, we're using that transistor in uh, conjunction uh, with a combination with a transformer. And so we have a conducting part at the input where you typically connect your thermoelectric generator. And since these um, uh, transformers are orientated uh, anti-parallel, we generate an electric, a negative charge on that capacitor C1. And as soon as the capacitor C1 uh, reaches the negative threshold voltage of that transistor, that transistor is turned off and all the current now is boosted to the output of that DC-DC converter. And so we are able to use small voltages to generate uh, higher output voltages. So this is a self-oscillating structure. We do not need an additional uh, oscillator. This structure starts with 20 millivolts, so we can use very small thermal gradients of typical thermoelectric generators. We are using here two transistors in parallel because the transistor T2 has a lower equivalent series resistors, uh, resistance. And as soon as the whole thing has started up, we disable transistor T1 and work only with T2 because that has a better efficiency. The efficiency you can see here on the diagram, we can uh, start with 50 millivolts in that diagram, reach an efficiency of 40%. And if the input voltage is increasing, uh, the efficiency of the whole converter is also increasing. So if we're using an input voltage of, uh, uh, let's say, 200 millivolts, we can achieve uh, uh, up to 90% efficiency. Another problem with energy harvesting and thermoelectric harvesting is that we always have to work in the maximum power point. So energy harvesting makes use of only very small electric power sources. And so here it is mandatory to match the converter always to the source. And if we want to match the converter or the, 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 the load to the source, we have to uh, consider the maximum power transfer theorem. This theorem says that the load resistance should always equal, equal the source resistance. So meaning our input voltage, input resistance of our converter has to match the source resistance of the thermoelectric harvester. So you can see here the output power as a function of the current and only for a dedicated output current, we are working in the maximum power point, And that is actually our goal to make use of the maximum power available. To achieve such a maximum power point system, or we call it maximum power point tracking, you can use the perturb and observe algorithm. This means you change the duty cycle. So the switching frequency of your DC-DC converter and you investigate the output current which you get from your source. And if you uh, discover that changing your duty cycle in a certain direction, the output power is increasing, then you further move the uh, switching uh, duty cycle in that direction. If you discover or investigate that the power is decreasing, of course, then you should change uh, the direction of the duty cycle uh, uh, alteration. So um, a practical system which this complete technology uh, is implementing is shown on this slide here. We have here a DC-DC converter with an external transformer to make use of even smaller thermal gradients. And we have a regulation loop here, which implements a maximum power point tracking algorithm with a perturb and observe uh, control regime. We have here actually a, a current um, a measurement uh, a circuit where we only use a shunt resistor and just measure the voltage drop over the shunt resistor because that's a good measure of the output power. And in that programmable mixed signal IC, we have implemented some kind of ampli ampli amplification. Uh, we have a filtering. Uh, we do a differentiation and we determine the signature 
of the uh, uh, power change and we adapt the switching frequency of the converter. So we have a closed regulation loop, which takes care of the maximum power point. The whole system is implemented on that printed circuit board here. So we have the transformer here, which is obvious the bulkiest uh, component. We have the DC DC converter electronics here, and we have the programmable uh, mixed signal uh, IC here on that uh, uh, small device. So after I explained uh, the power management, which is required to use these thermal gradients from Harvester, I will introduce two use cases. Uh, which we have implemented at our working group here. So the first use case is uh, targeting ex uh, industrial sensors. So if you're running a plan, uh, a machine or an engine, the maintenance and the downtime can add a serious amount of costs to that uh, operation. So it's always important to identify problems and predict possible failures uh, before any downtime. So uh, the maintenance before failures um, can be a serious advantage in this technical equipment. And of course, one important component to detect such problems are sensors and wireless radios. The big uh, advantage in these equipments is that there is often only a small frequency of measuring required. So you do not have to measure all these parameters or all these systems every microseconds or seconds. It's often uh, um, it's often um, good to measure them in minutes or hours or even days. And this, of course, reduces also the power consumption of the sensors and the power consumption of the wireless radios. And in this technical or uh, industrial equipment, there are always small thermal gradients available, which can be used with the help of thermal generators to power small sensors, uh, microcontrollers, and wireless transceivers. So here you can see one of our modules is called BlueTech Tech because it uses a thermoelectric generators generator blue because it uses a Bluetooth wireless radio. And as soon as we have a thermal gradient of three kelvins at the housing of this module, uh, we have produced around 100 microwatts. And this 100 microwatts is used to power the Bluetooth low energy radio. So we typically send one message per second, one telegram per second. Here on the right side, you see the output power as a function of thermal gradient. And of course, in that module, we produce, uh, we're using the DC-DC converter architecture I presented you in the preceding slide. Another use case for thermoelectric harvesting is our smart uh, screw. So uh, screw connections are used in numerous technical constructions. As you can see here on the right side, we use them in bridges, in pipelines, in wind turbines, and so on. Of course, a regular inspection in such technical construction is mandatory. You get a real advantage by permanent monitoring. On the other hand, the infrastructure for power or data transfer in these technical construction is always missing. So there are no cables, no wires available on such bridges or on such uh, pipelines. On the other hand, screws for mounting sensors are very familiar. These screws have an excellent and a standardized mechanical interface. And of course, and now we come to the, to the point here, these screws also offer an excellent thermal conductivity. So our vision was to have a screw with an integrated sensor, an integrated wireless transceiver, and an integrated power supply with thermoelectric generators so that we can uh, realize a fully integrated IoT device for, for, uh, for monitoring any kind of uh, screw connection. The key technology component is, of course, a piezoresistive layer, which is uh, mounted on the washer of the screw. We have an additional temperature sensor. From this uh, washer, we have a cable connected connection to the head of the screw. And in the head of the screw, we have a wireless module, a low power wireless uh, area network. And we have a RFID interface for programming. And finally, of course, in the head of the screw, we have a thermoelectric generator. And optionally, we have a solar cell or a battery. 
And now if you put that screw in any kind of object which shows a thermal gradient between the thread and the environment, the thermal generator in the screw generates electricity and powers the sensor electronics and powers the wireless module. And so you have a fully self-powered uh, screw which monitors itself, which monitors the preload force on the washer and can detect when the screw is uh, corrupted or when the screw is, is losing. So these are actually the architecture. We have the thermoelectric generator, some kind of capacitor, a DC DC converter, a charging circuit, a load switch, and finally a MyOT transmitter part port. MyOT is the uh, LP wireless uh, standard we are using in that, in that application. And finally, I have some performance data here. So for example, if we have a thermal difference between the thread and the environment of 33 kelvins, we have enough power to uh, transmit one telegram every 15 seconds. If we have a lower thermal gradient, of course, for example, 25 kelvins, you can uh, transmit every 30 seconds. And the minimum thermal gradient for that screw is around 5 kelvins. So there we achieve a, a transmission frequency of around 15 minutes. With that last slide, I'd like to thank you for your interest, and I'd like to pass over to my colleague, Nicolas. Thank you a lot. Thanks, Peter, and also thanks, Kilom and, and Rusty, for a very interesting talks. I found them quite, quite uh, enlightening, so I hope it was the same for all of you. So I think we will go, because I'm concerned a little bit about the time, we'll go straight to the questions and answers. So if you have any questions, please turn your, cam your microphone and your camera if you want on and please ask the question. Okay. So if we don't have any, I have one that we received by email in, in you could, uh, it was a um, question about, do you think, do any of the speakers think that the metal oxides could be a economically, economically viable material for thermoelectrics? Uh, I can try to answer in first. <laughs> yes, uh, of course, this kind of materials uh, are quite cheap. And so, of course, it's an important advantage compared to uh, classical bismuteluride and calcogenol materials. Uh, they are quite cheap, uh, but there are also other families like uh, silicides and alpha slur. Uh, which are also quite uh, cheap as thermoelectric materials. And um, there is more studies in uh, silicides and uh, alpha slurs uh, materials than for uh, metal oxide uh, materials. Um, I think we can find more easily uh, development uh, about devices using silicides and uh, alpha slur than compared to uh, metal oxide materials. But uh, these materials are quite cheap and um, they propose interesting advantage, uh, but I think they are still to be uh, developed to, to be competitive. It's not, uh, it's not already the case. So I don't know if uh, the other speaker uh, have also uh, an answer or, or want to complete my uh, my answer for, for for this point. Uh, um, Guillaume, I think you are right because uh, we also looked at these oxide-based materials. I think the the problem is the performance. You know, uh, of course it's cheaper as you already mentioned, but uh, uh, so is the performance. The performance is also poor you know, for these oxide-based materials. So I think uh, to develop a device based on those uh, materials is, is always a little bit challenging, you know, if the performance is not improving uh, because there, there is a compromise, you know, that's so, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Jose. Uh, well, after getting a couple of questions through the chat, uh, one is specific to Peter, says, could you give us a rough, um, cost target for the, that blue TG device that you showed in one of your user cases, uh, you were talking about large volume, like a thousand or something like that. 
Yeah, so the cost target for the Bluetech device is between 30 and 50 euros. So it depends on the on the thermoelectric device you use and on the housing. I would say between 30 and 50 euros. And perhaps there is another question in the chat. Uh, I can read it. Can you provide some advice guidelines on what kind of temperature gradients can expect it for various applications, e.g. variables, and what can be done to maximize it? So regarding variables, we have a very good idea and understanding, but the problem with variables is between the skin and the environment, there is typically a thermal gradient between three or four Kelvin. Uh, it depends, of course, on the person. And uh, to maximize that, I think there is not an option to maximize it, that the goal is always to, uh, to use that thermal gradient as efficient as possible, and of course, to to maximize the thermal resistance of the thermoelectric harvester or the thermoelectric device, because then you do not have to cool the colder side. Regarding industrial applications, that's more easier. We have often higher thermal gradients, for example, in motors, engines, or plants, you typically can expect. Uh, starting with five kelvins to 10 kelvins, we also have some applications where we have 30 kelvins uh, relative to the environment. And all this depends what kind of spot you're targeting and in what kind of environment you're working. But typically, the industrial applications are more easier than the applications on the human body. Uh, I can only add what Peter already uh, said, you know. Uh, on human body, this is a big challenge because we are working on a on a project where we would like to put this thermoelectric generator on human body, and as Peter suggested, it is only hardly you can get you know three to four degree you know temperature gradient. Uh, of course, another parameter which is very important is the environment you know wh wh where you are. And um, if you are in a very cold weather, of course you can you can get a larger temperature gradient. Or you're in a very hot weather, you know. Uh, but but another challenge that we are facing is that um, human body, um, you know, that if you wear some kind of cloth, you know, uh, some kind of clothing, you know, then after a certain amount of time, you know, then the temperature gets homogenized, you know. So the uh, it's, it's very difficult to maintain that temperature gradient. Uh, one thing is that you cannot put any kind of active thermal management. You know, uh, one thing I think people need to look into is that uh, innovative design of the heat sink. You know, but also you need to think about that uh, these heat sinks need cannot be bulky. You know, because it is on body. You know, uh, there are some recent work that is done on uh, polymer based heat sink. You know. So that's very interesting as well, you know. So of course it is a challenge, and for, for wearables, it's 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 a big big problem. That's it. Are there any more questions? Uh, again, you can either ask through uh, your turning on your microphone, and you want to put it on the chat. Okay. Listen, I, I think I said I mentioned to Ology when I'm doing your registration. If you have any further questions, you can think about something uh, later on. Send me an email and I can pass it to the speakers and they can uh, respond to you offline. Uh, I think you already know that the, the webinar has been recorded, so you'll be able to, in a few days' time, it will be available through on the website if you want to watch it again or if you want to show it to any of your colleagues. So yeah, I would like just to finish thanking again the three speakers. I think that was quite interesting and a huge range from, from basic materials to, to applications and actually examples in real life. And uh, uh, thanks again to all of you. Obviously, a webinar will be nothing if we have no, no attendees. So thanks again, and hopefully we'll be in touch soon. Uh, we don't think we'll be any enables webinars uh, during the summer, but once we go back in the autumn, we'll, we'll go back to our series probably to having one every month. So keep an eye on our website and uh, you'll be up to date on what's happening. So thanks everybody again and take care. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye-bye.